Hey everybody, I'm just going to wait a few minutes for a few people to get on and once I see that a few are on, we're going to go ahead and get started. I'm excited about our session tonight. We're going to be talking about a great topic and so we're just going to wait. Hey cuz, we're just going to wait a second for people to just log on and then we'll get started. Listen, as we get started, I want to encourage you to share this video on your page. There's going to be some great information. Either you have experienced an affair or you know someone who has. I think we've all been there uh, or know someone who has. So if you can disseminate the information by sharing this with as many people as possible, I would really, really appreciate that. Today, tonight, we're going to talk about the real reason why people are unfaithful and how to prevent it. Now, I know many of you have said, well, golly, how can you keep somebody else from having an affair. Thanks, babe. I appreciate your support. All those hearts coming from my beautiful wife. How can you prevent somebody from having uh, an affair? Well, if you begin to understand what causes these affairs, uh, you can participate in preventing it and helping your partner become aware of it. Or if you're the one who has been unfaithful, these are some of the things that you can um, kind of be mindful of as you transition throughout the course of your relationship. Now, most people have a tendency to always blame situations, circumstances, uh, uh, other people, temptations from the outside world as to the reason why they were unfaithful or they have a tendency to blame their spouse. If you didn't do this, I wouldn't have done that or if you, because you've deprived me of this, that's why I did that. And so what happens is it's a victim mentality and we're always looking for someone to blame. But you've got to realize that when you're pointing the finger, there are always three fingers pointing back at you. And so I want to talk to you tonight, not about external circumstances that lead to an affair, but internal realities that cause affairs to occur. There was an awesome study that was done <coughs> a number of years ago. And this study was done by a group of people who were studying uh, alcoholics that continue to relapse. So after these particular alcoholics went through a 12-step program and they were clean for several weeks to several months, possibly several years, they would notice that a number of them would slip right back into drinking again. So in essence, they became alcoholics all over again. And so they wanted to know why this was occurring. And based upon their research and their, <clears throat> and their study and their findings, they discovered that it all came down to internal mood states, meaning their internal emotional state led them to run back to the bottle. And in essence, what they did was they uh, created an acronym called HALT-B, okay? H-A-L-T-B. And each of the letters in HALT-B represents a different emotional mood state. And these are some of the mood states that we find within ourselves that also cause us to be unfaithful. So let's go through them very quickly. Now, I'm overcoming a little cold, <coughs> so if I cough, bear with me. But H in HALT B stands for hungry. They found out that when alcoholics became physically hungry for food, rather than uh, eating food and getting a source of nourishment from a meal, they would run to a bottle. Uh, the A in HALT B stands for angry, that whenever they became emotionally irate and angry and frustrated or depressed or wh wherever they had a high volatility of emotion, rather than suppressing it with something that was healthy and productive, they ran to a bottle. Because, you know, when you drink, it has a, it has a tendency to, to sedate you, right? And so they noticed that the L in HALT B stands for lonely, that whenever uh, alcoholics were seeking companionship and felt lonely and felt like nobody was there to support them, rather than having personal human contact, they would find comfort in a bottle. The T in HALT B stands for tired. Whenever they became physically worn out, emotionally tired, they would find some type of companionship, some type of drive, some type of energy source in the bottle. And the B in Hall B stands for bored. That in essence, when they were, they became bored. And I'm sure you've heard this before. An idle mind is an evil mind. So some people shop, you know, other people do uh, things that are non-productive. In this case, these individuals would run to a bottle and drink, 
Halt B. And what we found is that these same emotional mood states that existed within these uh, relapsing alcoholics are the same emotional mood states that exist within us that often, oftentimes causes us to be unfaithful. So just think about it in the context of a relationship. When you are just hungry, you're hungry and you're thirsting for more because you feel like within the realm of your relationship, you are just not getting enough. You're not getting the love that you want. You're not getting the attention that you want. You're not getting your emotional needs met. Maybe you're not being sexually fulfilled as you feel you need to be. And because you are starving and yearning and burning, if you will, for something more, and, and, and of course you're not getting it, this internal mood state of dissatisfaction causes you to venture out and to connect with someone outside of the realm of your marriage. Uh, the A, stands for angry. You know, a lot of times when people are just fed up, I'm just sick and tired of being sick and tired. You get on my nerves. I can't stand you no more. I'm angry. And so when you're angry, anger is a form of punishment. And oftentimes we seek to punish our partners. We seek to get even. We seek revenge. So because you hurt me, fine, I'm going to hurt you too. And I'm going to make you feel it. And so what we do is sometimes out of spite and intention, we run out and connect with someone else uh, as a way of breaking the vow within our relationship because of an internal mood state. So rather than <clears throat> rearranging the emotions that exist within us, we fulfill uh, a desire based upon that anger. Then you have L, which stands for lonely. I know so many people who have been in relationships for one year, 10 years, 20 years that are still lonely because being alone is not synonymous with being lonely. There are many people who are in committed relationships who are laying in the bed next to somebody else, but still have a feeling of loneliness. And so there's an emotional disconnect. There's no companionship, possibly not even a partnership. We're just two individuals who are living in the same home, passing by like you know uh, ships in the middle of the night, never to communicate, never to touch, never to become intimate, and so loneliness sets in. And because I can't connect with you and I have no rapport and relationship with you, I naturally, whether consciously, unconsciously, intentionally, or by accident, will gravitate into a connection with someone else based upon that loneliness. But the loneliness is an internal feeling. It's an internal emotion, and there are things that you can do to adjust that. The T, once again, stands for tired. When you're just sick and tired of being tired, when you're just sick and tired of the same old situation, the same old patterns, we've been dealing with this problem for years, it's not getting better, we've gone to a counselor, we've read books, you know, we went to seminars, we've talked about it a thousand times till we're blue in the face, and I, I'm just done. And when you are tired, not just physically, but emotionally tired, and you're ready to call it quits, you're like, well, there's no point in trying to maintain integrity within this relationship. So sometimes people venture out into the unknown and connect with somebody that they should not be affiliated with. And then the B stands for bored. Now, if you've been married long enough, nine times out of 10, after the emotional uh, in love feeling begins to wither and wane, normalcy sets in. And so now that things are normal and predictable and monotonous, as they say, monogamy oftentimes leads to monotony. We don't date anymore. We don't have fun anymore. There's no recreational companionship. There's just nothing. All we do is go to church and come home, go to work and come home. We raise kids, we pay bills, and that's it. <clears throat> and frankly, I'm bored with this relationship and I'm looking for some level of excitement that I no longer get from you. So I venture off. And that's what typically happens. Halt B. So if you're the individual who's struggling with these internal mood states or emotions, or if your partner is struggling with these mood states, then I would encourage you, I would encourage you to have a conversation with one another and deal with each one of the letters in the acronym. So if hunger is an issue, Think about the last time you went to a restaurant on an empty stomach. You were hungry. And, and guess what? If the food was phenomenal, but the service was horrible, nine times out of ten, you didn't go back. But if the food was average at best, 
but the service was unbelievable. You may give that restaurant another chance. And so when it comes to your relationship, it's important that you learn how to serve your partner. So if there is a hunger or a thirst based upon a void or an emptiness that exists within, it is your responsibility to your partner or your partner's responsibility to you to begin to ask, how can I serve you? How can I feed you? How can I quench your thirst? And, for, and guess what? For every person, is going to be something different. If you're familiar with the five love languages, we know that according to that book written by Gary Chapman, uh, love language number one is quality time. Love language number two, uh, acts of service. Love language number three, the giving of gifts. Love, love language number four, words of affirmation. And love language number five, physical touch. So it may be something different for your partner. So rather than loving your partner and serving your partner the way that you feel they need to be served, ask them and then honor their request. And once you know what it is, do your fair share of feeding them on a consistent basis. Could you imagine going two, three days without a meal? You would starve. Uh, struggle with mal uh, malnourishment. You need to be fed three times a day, every single day, seven days a week. Likewise, when it comes to the realm of a relationship, one of your responsibilities is to serve your partner. So in essence, marriage is not about what you can do for me. It's about what I can do for you. And if I'm doing for you, and both of us are operating according to this principle, we both win. <coughs> so the A, anger. How, to you, how do you deal with the anger? By having conversations, what I have found is that most couples do not know how to talk. They do not know how to resolve conflict. And so as a result, they become highly emotional and then conflict occurs. And then once the conflict occurs and it goes too far, then we enter into a silent treatment and don't communicate with each other for two, three hours to two, three days to two, three weeks. And so that anger is festering on the inside. And every day that goes by, it's getting progressively worse and progressively worse. So the best way to deal with the anger is to have conversations where you're operating according to specific ground rules, what we would call rules of engagement, to engage in conversation to get to the core of the issue. And when you can begin to do that, all of a sudden, that emotion will begin to subside and you can enter into healthy conversations that are productive and mutually beneficial. The L, I'm just lonely. I'm up in this house all by myself. I feel like a single parent mother, a single parent father, you out doing your thing, you at work all day, you're on the computer all day, you're connected with other people, you have all these other relationships, and I'm alone all by myself. I am lonely. Well, I need to serve you. Because if you feel that way, you didn't enter into this marriage to be imprisoned and to be isolated and to be in a solitary state. You enter into this relationship because of companionship. And so one of the things that you two need to begin to do is to reconnect emotionally and physically. Now I'm not saying sex. Sex is awesome, but physical interaction is important. See, there's a major difference between what we will call uh, physical proximity and quality time. For instance, if I'm in the television room watching TV and my wife's sitting next to me, now, she's on her computer or on her phone scrolling through Facebook. We have physical proximity because we're in the same room, sitting on the same couch, but there is no quality time. There is no intimacy because our attention are on two different things. But if we are together engaged in something that is taking up both of our attentions, pointed in the right direction, or we're engaging in conversation with one another, that is an example and an expression of quality time. And when, <coughs> excuse me, when you begin to feed your partner with time, with words, with affirmations, they become filled. So when you think about a, a tank, all of us have a car. In order for us to get to, from point A to point B, it requires gas in the tank. When the tank is empty, you have to fill it back up. And as long as there's gas in the vehicle, you can move in a forward direction. And so all of us have an emotional love tank. So it's important for us to assess where our love tank is. So on a weekly basis, <coughs> possibly at the beginning of the week, at the end of the week, ask your partner, how's your love tank? Is it full? Is it half full? Is it quarter of a tank full? What can I do to fill it up? And if you're taking the time to ask those questions, 
trust and believe that feeling of loneliness will begin to dissipate. Then T is tired. I'm tired of how things are. I'm tired of our financial situation. I'm tired of our emotional state. I'm tired of our sex life. I'm tired of these kids around here acting a fool. I'm tired of this wreck of a house. I'm just tired and sick and tired of being tired. Well, in that particular situation, you're going to have to come up with a game plan. See, many people are married, but they're not married on purpose, meaning there's no purpose to their marriage. There are no goals attached to their relationship. One of the reasons why we have Couples Academy is we help couples to have better relationships. But one of the reasons why we created the Couples Business School is to teach couples how to be married with purpose and to find fulfillment and business and ministry within the realm of their relationship. And when you have that, all of a sudden, this whole tired situation goes away because now there's always a goal ahead of you that you're striving for, that you're moving towards, and you're moving in a direction that gets you ultimately where you want to go. So the question becomes, what is your chief aim for your marriage? Somebody is blowing up. I love it. Keep them coming. Keep them coming. What is your chief aim for your marriage? All of you as individuals, when you've come together, you become one. But in that oneness, there's a power of agreement. In that power of agreement, when you're coming together, there should be an ultimate goal, purpose, and agenda ahead of you. In essence, there should be a marriage mastermind. And when you truly understand the purpose of the marriage mastermind, which we have no time to get in tonight, it will revolutionize your relationship. Remind me to talk about that in another session. So, T stands for tired, and the way to overcome that is to begin to work on your game plan for your marriage. B, finally, (coughs) excuse me, folks, stands for bored. I just need something different. I need something new. I need newness. Every single time Danielle and I travel around the world, it doesn't matter if we have white people in the audience, black people, uh, old, young Uh, They've been married for two years. They've been married for 20 years. All of them want the same thing. They're all trying to figure out how can we keep the passion in our relationship? You know, according to the book, The Five Love Languages, it states that the in love feeling, which naturally takes place in the initiation of the relationship, really is the infatuation stage. And that feeling of infatuation or that in love feeling only lasts for two years. And then it all of a sudden declines then a new or different type of love has to kick in. This is where you have the caring love, uh, the committed form of love, God's agape love. Now, when you operate in that, it's an act. It is a decision of your will. And when you're doing the right thing, that in love feeling can come back. So the goal is to regain that in love feeling, to regain the feeling of infatuation, and it does that by dating more. It does that through recreational companionship. You do that through quality time. You do that through establishing rituals to protect the sanctity of your relationship. And these are the things that you must begin to do in order to what? Help this internal mood state that we've identified as HALT B. So as I wrap up, (coughs) excuse me, as I wrap up, H stands for hungry, A stands for angry, L stands for lonely, T stands for tired, B stands for bored. I would highly encourage you as a couple to have some quality time, to do two things. One day of the week, you should be dating. It should be your fun day, your play day. The other day of the week should be your work day. Well, what does your work day look like? As a couple, you're working on your relationship. You're having these conversations. You're reviewing these videos. You're entering into discussion. You're seeing where your partner feels or where they're at in terms of certain situations. And you're doing it for the purpose of establishing a sense of oneness. Not just sexually, not just physically, not just mentally and emotionally, but spiritually as well. When you truly become one, you're building up a wall of protection in that marriage. And infidelity will become a thing of the past. I hope you enjoyed tonight's session. I gotta go because I have a a one-on-one session with a couple. But listen, I would highly encourage each and every one of you to post questions. Like, as I'm watching you, I'm on my little uh, 
iPhone, so I really can't even read comments. I just see likes and shares and, and love signs popping up all over the place. But inbox me with your question so that I can address it in our next session. Really quick, just want to let everybody know, the book, The Audacity of Marriage, finally came out. This is my personal copy. Um, I had to, uh, I guess this is what you would call, um, I forget what they call this, but it's the, uh, the copy you get just to make sure everything's great. I just ordered hundreds of copies. I will have it in a week's time. So all of those that pre-ordered the book, the book will be delivered as soon as it gets in my hand. I'm so excited about it. If you notice, this is no lightweight book. This is 233 pages. I put my heart and soul into this book. If you want to know how to enhance your marriage, protect your marriage, and take it to the next level, I highly recommend right now. You can go to Amazon.com. You can buy it at uh, paperback for $16.95, or, and we're having a 75% off sale. You can get the Kindle version tonight for, I think, like $3.42. So go to Amazon.com or go to theaudacityofmarriage.com and get your copy today. Love you guys. I will see you soon. You're in my prayers.